Hey, writers and readers, thanks for tuning in for our episode today, which is one we're really excited about. We've had multiple listeners, including Philip Clapman, who have reached out to us and requested that we cover a low residency program. And so we're thrilled for today's episode featuring Koye Oyedeji, a brilliant writer and current student at Warren Wilson. Koye has provided a wealth of information, not just on Warren Wilson, but on the low res experience in general. And I'm excited for you all to hear about it. If you have a request of your own, please feel free to send us an email at mfawriterspodcast at gmail.com, or you can give us a shout on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Please follow us there for up-to-date info on the pod. And if you have a minute, please write a review of our show on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute, and it helps other people find the show. One listener recently wrote, couldn't be more of a fan if I tried. I listen to Jared's podcast on my walks around the Bronx and on days when I'm not reading. It has been really insightful to listen to the phenomenal writers he brings on. They're well-versed and well-spoken, discussing the many facets of the writing process and their programs. Thanks to the amazing advice within, I had the courage to apply to MFA programs and recently got accepted to a dream program. I'm eternally grateful for the way this podcast has prepared me, not only for acceptance, but rejection, as well as pacing in my writing life. Thank you so much for that, and congratulations to that listener on their recent acceptance. We couldn't be happier for you. Now on to the episode. MFA Writers, the podcast where we talk to creative writing MFA students about their program, their process, and a piece they're working on. I'm your host, Jared McCormick. Today I'm with Koye Oyedeji. His writing has appeared in Plowshares, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Believer, Wasafiri, The Good Journal, and elsewhere. He has contributed to a number of anthologies, received scholarships to attend the Breadloaf Writers Conference and the Suwani Writers Conference, and has also previously attended the Vona and Kalalu writing workshops. He lives in Washington, D.C., and is currently a Holden Scholar in Warren Wilson's Low Res MFA program, where he just entered his final semester. He's currently hard at work on a composite novel, and he's brought an excerpt to read for us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Jared. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from a story entitled Mr. Tuck, uh, the mayor of Downing Street. And just to give a little context, um, the, the narrator, Emmanuel, is a 16-year-old um, boy of Nigerian-American descent. Um, and Mr. Tuck is an African-American man. They've met previously once, and this is their second meeting. And he is taking a trip from the metro station home, a route that he's not supposed to take. I kept those trips through the neighborhood a secret because... In order to take the shortest route to the station, I would pass Brooklyn Manor. I didn't really think much of it, but knew my parents would freak out if they knew this. It's not like we were green. We weren't coming from the boondocks or anything like that. But they were nervous about the move into a new city and how best to fraternize with the locals, which always meant how best not to. By now, the summer had long handed over its craft to the fall, and so you had perfect weather in the city and you could casually make your way without feeling like the sun was still bullying you. This was around the time I ran into Mr. Tuck again. I would see him on my way home from school every now and then, at the same time, and almost in the same set of clothes, like his wardrobe was limited to two or three daishikis, and even fewer khaki. Most times he'd been alone in his butterfly chair, with his tin flask of what I'd later learned was lemonade, and even much later, I'd surmise it had a little kick in it. Sometimes, though, there'd be a couple of other elderly men out there with him. He would always take the time to look my way, even when in the throes of conversation. When this happened too many times for me to ignore the intentionality, I gave him a friendly nod. The next time I saw him after this, he said, The frog pays attention to the little fish in the river. And though I didn't know what he meant by this, I made it a point to actually say hello during my next encounter. Cows without tails can count on God to chase the flies away. I don't know what he meant by this. And then the next day, a bucktooth is trouble for the mouth. 
I would get to the end of the block, pull out my notebook and write these things down. Then I'd spend the rest of the walk wondering if he was trying to come off as old wise man in the hood, or if he was actually coming for me, slinging subtle insults. So eventually, when I saw him again, before he even had the chance to drop some mysterious mess on me, I said, you know my name, sir. I don't know yours. Well, look at this, he replied, and leaned his chin onto the hands that clasped the top of his stick. It speaks. And what is your name again? I told him. Well, Emmanuel, he continued. Depends on what you're asking. Theodore Tuck is my slave name, see? But you may address me as Baba Tunde, because it means the father has returned in Yoruba. And Theodore had been my grandfather's name. Address, I said, like a king? He nodded. I'll take that. We're all kings in this world, he said, and then thought about this before continuing. Except the women. They are queens. He told me he had African blood in him. When I asked, oh yeah, what part? He replied, the knee, the foot, what did it matter? He waved his fancy staff at me, and I came closer. I could see its carved faces with bulging eyes and heavy eyelids. At the top, there was a face with a scythe-like headdress and two faces below this to either side. Do you understand what I'm saying? He said. I shrugged. That all black people are from Africa? Yes, he nodded. Then he shook his head. But no, I'm talking about Yoruba, man. Your race. Yoruba is the first race that mankind has ever known. The cradle of goddamn civilization. You dig that? I told him that I did not. I did not dig that because I didn't understand what he was talking about. That's when he shared with me the creation tale of the sky god, Aludamari, and how Aludamari gave the god of whiteness a chain, a bit of earth in a snail shell, and a five-toed chicken before he sent him down to create the earth. I whipped my notebook out, asked if I could write this down, and started trying to keep up with the rest of it. How the god of whiteness stopped off at a party being held by some other gods and got drunk. And it was his brother, Oduduwa, who went ahead and carried out Oludamari's instructions and created Earth. He called me out for calling it a dope myth. And when I replied that that's not actually how he thought the world was made, he asked me what did it matter. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, does something really have to happen for you to believe in it? Do we need to know if the tortoise raced the hare for us to believe in its power? I don't know, I said, because it felt like he had a point. I guess not. Stories are our technology, he said. And while I didn't go in for everything he was saying, that sounded pretty cool to me. So I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, you ain't never heard of Aoife? And When I said, no, he shook his head like he'd smelt something tragic. Oh man, now I've got to be the one to tell you where you're coming from. You know what they say about not knowing where you're coming from? They say you're traveling without moving. You've got to look up and look around you, he said. And when I literally did this, he said, no fool. I'm talking about your ancestors holding your hand. He pointed at me right this second, all the time. Koye, thanks for reading and thanks for being here. Um, it's great to be here. Great to be on. This excerpt centers around an early encounter between an American boy of Nigerian descent, Emmanuel, and Mr. Tuck, an elderly African-American man who seems to know a great deal of Yoruba cosmology. Do you mind explaining the Yoruba people and their religion a bit just for listeners in case they don't know? Yeah, and it's funny that you say Yoruba religion because that's kind of what my work is addressing the fact that um, this is seen as something that's very much uh, gone underground or in, in the sort of cracks of Yoruba culture, which you might argue predominantly uh, when it comes to religion is either Christian or Muslim, right? Uh, so this is, this is a practice that, that predates like colonial Africa amongst the Yoruba, which is um, an ethnic group within uh Nigeria, Southwest. Um, this is a practice that predates the, the sort of arrival of European colonizers in which their kind of, their way of life, their religion, their culture was based upon 
a lot of principles that centered around this cosmology where you would seek um, guidance from uh, what's called a babalawa, which is sort of an intermediary between um, the Orishas, essentially the gods, um, and uh, yourself. And your ancestors would also act as sort of like the guidance, your guidance in life. And this is something that, that was seen as kind of idolatry when colonial England, uh, colonial Britain arrived in Nigeria and um, many Nigerians moved away from it. And yeah, that's uh, uh, in some ways that's pretty kind of traumatic to have such a kind of important spiritual corpus uh, in your life and, and for that to be disrupted. And, and that's kind of what really interests me. And, and that's why I wanted to kind of address some of this in my work. So was there a moment in your life when you really started to become interested in this and started looking into it? And like, um, like when did you start getting inspired by this and, and putting it into your writing? Right. So bingo, right. That's, that's, you just hit it on the head there. There's a particular moment, right? Where you are kind of, or me rather, is kind of looking to understand a little bit more of where I'm coming from as a, as a sort of black Brit, black British born, um, of Nigerian descent. I had never taken a trip to Nigeria and, um, my parents didn't speak much about their childhood. And, you know, I remember being sort of in my mid, 20s, uh, looking to go to graduate school and just being like, you know what? I, I, I want to learn more about where I'm coming from and I'm going to enroll in this particular, um, college, the School of African, the School of Oriental and African Arts, University of London, which kind of specializes in the, ox, the, the other rather. Um, and so I went along there and I'm thinking sort of like, yeah, I'm going to have this great understanding of like where I'm coming from. I'm going to um, meet all the brothers and sisters and not really sort of being kind of naive to the sort of um, institutions that, that are available for the, the, the study of Africa and, and realizing that it was very much a place for developmental studies and, and the arts, et cetera, was this small corner of this. And I say all this to say the biggest, my biggest kind of lesson came when I, I met the filmmaker and Howard University professor, Montre Arza Missouri, um, an African American who was the first person to kind of mention Ifa to me. And so you have this juxtaposition. That was my Mr. Tuck moment where you have this juxtaposition of like me <laughs> of Yoruba descent learning about things that my parents have never once mentioned from an African-American woman. So would you say that's the main reason you chose to have your story center around these two characters was because of that kind of experience that you had yourself? I would say it's more than that. It's that that experience is what brought me to Ether. And then just learning just how um, integral it was to uh, the Yoruba. And then again, how that was kind of, uh, taken away from um, Nigerians uh, during the colonial period kind of speaks to addressing a traumatic moment, right? It's it's almost like therapy, right? You have to kind of address uh, the trauma. You have to face that trauma in order to kind of get a better understanding of who you are. And And for me, it was learning about these things just as much as understanding why these, these, these things were never mentioned to me. And I'll see, and you'll see there's a later scene in the, in the story where Emmanuel's mother kind of says, these things are juju and black magic and we're not to speak of them. And, and that was like my experience as I started to have more and more conversations with a particular generation who grew up in Nigeria, Yoruba's, under the colonial regime. Well, it seems to me like these characters are kind of coming from two different places, but they have this kind of shared history, even if they don't 
know it yet, right? And so what is it about those like different subcultures or those different diasporas uh, and the similarities and differences between the two that that interest you or inspire you? Uh, I think that's twofold, right? So in the one sense, um, you have this idea of um, the, the, the what I call the kind of marginalized experience period, how I can kind of walk into an office, uh, regardless of being sort of black British of Nigerian descent, and, and an African American woman could walk into an office and, and realizing that we're both in a minority and we're going to both face a margin, these kind of marginalized experiences. And, and that, and in some ways that goes for kind of any sort of marginalization, whether you're a woman, whether, um, uh, you have a disability. There's a way in which you kind of move through the world as a minority, and that's in the margins, should I say. And that's a shared experience within itself. Um, and I was interested in that, that shared experience. Um, and in this case, we're talking about trauma, the legacy of slavery coupled with the legacy of colonialism. And let's have a conversation about that. But in addition, on this other hand, right, um, you know, I was, I was, I was recently reading, uh, this short story and it kind of talked about, um, you, you, you know, I won't name it because there's a, there's a way in which kind of it, uh, I think what I'm about to say could be perceived as criticism, but it isn't. And so I'm kind of like want to be clear about my stance on that. It's, um, and it was about a, a kind of young black male and the ways in which they were profiled as moving through the world and a great story. But I found myself reading it. And being like, you know, this, this, this story is not speaking to me, like literally, because you don't need to tell me as, as a young black male what it's like to be profiled. I kind of know that. And I'm really interested in, in, in those conversations. Um, I'm really interested in having those conversations where I'm speaking to black people. And I think some of the best literature has, 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 has really kind of, been fostered out of that. And, and I, I think to like Sula and how that's a story of, of, um, black sisterhood, right? With Nell and, and Sula. And then you think about sort of even fences. That's, that's like what it means for Troy to be a husband to Rose, what it means for him to be a father to Corey. Um, and so there's a kind of, and, and Tony Morrison was really good at that, a, a kind of like, Building questions about well, why they're not any sort of white pr- protagonists and, and, and moving away from the white gaze. And I think that for me, I'm really interested in black relationships, period. And then you also told me that you're interested in examining those tensions through the lens of identity, power, and class. Um, so, I, I, which made me curious if when you sit down to write something, Let's say you're sitting down to write a story. Are you thinking like, in this story, I'm going to examine this through the lens of identity? Like, is that something you're thinking about before you sit down? Or is that something that you're kind of coming to later? You know, I want to hasten, I guess, and say that I think that writers move through phases, right, um, in their lives, uh, where they try to reckon with certain stuff that might be um, key to their lives. And so I think identity was something that um, I really, really kind of grappled with in, 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 in some of my, like, really early teenage writing, like what it means to be black in Britain. Um, and then, and then you, you, you sort of, as you get a little older, uh, you realize that entity, identity becomes more, more fluid in a way, and you're kind of looking for those intersections. Um, and addressing some of the more complexities. So uh, uh, to answer your question, it's not something that I ever feel comes conscious, consciously. I think it's a, a reflection of like growth and maturity and some of the questions that you ask and how m- more complicated you get, older you get. But I don't think I ever sit down and say, this is going to be a story about identity. And then you told me that you are particularly interested in how class affects relationships. 
What is it about class that particularly piques your interest? I was going to say, and class too, because class kind of seeps into everything. Like it really seeps into everything. And I think that, um, I don't think that it's necessarily unique to me as a, to have these conversations as a black British person or even a British person. I think there's a European, there's a marked European history of the bourgeoisie and class is a conversation that is actively happening in, in places like London, uh, the UK and, and continental Europe. When I mean these conversations, I think that, you know, these questions are showing up in the work. US is interesting to me that I feel like the conversation around class kind of gets sidelined. And we're, we're, we're kind of predominantly talking about race, which of course is, is, is a huge and important, um, conversation. But the way in which, uh, class kind of factors into this is something that I really think we should pay more attention to. You know, my mind goes to, goes to history and say like Bacon's rebellion of 1676 and how you had these kind of, um, you had this group where you had white indentured servants kind of rally alongside blacks to, to, for a sort of more rights and a better way of life. And in, um, kind of, that was a failed rebellion, but kind of in response to that, Virginians were kind of shaken up by that alliance of, of, of blacks and indentured whites and and you can kind of, if you look through throughout history, you can kind of look at how, um, following that period, white indentured servants were given more rights and there was a, a heavier reliance on slavery. And so you have this kind of juxtaposition of freedom and slavery and how they are increasingly demarcated along racial lines within this, from the 17th century onwards. And I think that race can be a kind of way to blindside people, <laughs> to be quite honest. Uh, Another example of that, you know, I look to history, but then I also kind of look to recent events and um, what happened at the Capitol in January and how, you know, and I, I want to be really clear when I say this, aside from the kind of the racist attitudes of many of that group, there, there are probably a lot more that people have in common. Um, those people storming the, the, the Capitol, there's probably a lot more social and economically that they have in common with a lot of uh black and brown people across the country than say trump and so what you kind of have here is um there's a way to almost wipe the dog you know and what 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 i think the previous administration were very really good at is um being sort of this elite who used the everyday working white man to kind of say look Brown people are taking the job. These black bodies represent threat. When in truth, statistics show that like immigrants, even so-called illegal immigrants, you know, are not really kind of the issue here. Um, and the issue might lay, if you ask me, in a lot of what corporate America is doing and capitalism, but a great way to divide sort of the every man living in, in, in say, the white working class collar worker from the black um blue collar worker is is to say hey you know this construct called race is 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 the problem and really it's a lot of the policies and the subsidies we give to corporations and a whole load of other things and really and, and i'll end this there that's what kind of i feel people like aoc and bernie sanders are uh feel like a threat to a lot of people because they're, they're, they're onto something. You know, the whole time you were saying that I was thinking about, you know, how the way that people talk about Martin Luther King Jr. in the States, um, they just kind of erase what was a big part of his ideology at the end of his life, which was fighting poverty and fighting for the working class. People don't talk about that. It's, they just view him through um, his uh, speeches and marches about race. They just erase that other part of his, of his kind of platform, if you will, in which he was trying to bring together black folks and white working class folks to like fight back against capitalism. Right. Um, and that's not talked about at all anymore. 
That's correct, because there's a kind of, you know, even when we think about curriculum, um, there's a kind of uh, curriculum of color that's safe, that um, <laughs> we want to kind of push forward, and we don't really want to, uh, we want we want to talk about pe- peaceful protest and, and Martin Luther King being inspired by Gandhi, and you don't see the sort of the likes of Malcolm X, or even the, the work that that, that Black Pan- the Black Panthers were trying to do, and by that I mean the community work, right? Um, and you don't you don't find this in a lot of curriculum because it, again it represents a threat to, in my opinion, to the apparatus that is capitalism. Well, let's go back to the piece a little bit. There's this uh, line in there that I, I really liked where uh, Mr. Tuck says to Emmanuel, "You know what they say about not knowing where you're coming from." They say you're traveling without moving. So how important do you think knowing where you're coming from is, I mean, we've talked a little bit already about how important that is to your writing, but I'm wondering how important that is for writers in general to think about where they're coming from in relation to what they're writing. That is, that is a super, that is a super interesting question. I don't know if it's necessarily prescriptive. Right. Uh, there, there's this age old kind of conversation between writing about what you know, um, and sort of how much cachet or permission do we have? Do we grant ourselves to write about the things that we don't know? Um, my life, I think it was important as someone, minor- a minority in the UK, first generation. Black British, not really appearing in um, the uh, sort of sense of the national identity, what it means to be a, a proud British British person. You know, if there was a picture of that, it would not look like me. Um, and so, I think for, for our generation, it was super important to know where we're coming from in order to navigate that quagmire. You know, I say, I say, I kind of look at at Colin Kaepernick kneeling to the U.S. flag, um, and 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 the pushback against that, and and how that's unpatriotic, etc. Well, just in the ways that I I never know what it's like. I'll never know what it's like to be white. I'll never know what it's like to be patriotic. Just because of the displacement that I felt growing up in the UK, I didn't feel necessarily feel um, any allegiance to the UK. And as someone that was born in the Nigeria diaspora, I never felt any sense of like this is what it feels to be a proud Nigerian. And then again, you know, um, I have a different relationship to the US flag as a foreigner. It's like, well, okay then. <laughs> um, so this this kind of Unrootedness, uh, I think, was is is important for me to understand where I'm coming from, and that's not just, and that's why um, I am working on a composite novel so that I could bring all these different worlds together. Where I'm coming from is not just being part of this Yoruba legacy, but it's also being black and British, and it's also being black in America. Well, we've talked about the fact that you were born to Nigerian parents in the UK. Now you're a long-term resident of the US. You live in DC, but at times you study in North Carolina. Um, Before the interview, you described yourself as a minority whose identity and marginalization has not only been framed by the space you occupy within an oppressive systemic society, but also how you navigate relationships with other minority groups within the diaspora. So, Having lived in those different places throughout your life, how have you found that being in a certain place affects your state of mind and also your writing? Oh, um, I'm going to come at this question in a slightly different way, um, a slightly different angle, because this is something that I think about a lot, and I, I kind of call it that that AA Alcoholics Anonymous kind of motto that they sling where you know the first step to acknowledging uh the first step towards combating your alcoholism is to acknowledge that you're an alcoholic um and i think that there's ways in which you acknowledge who you are 
and the privileges that um, it grants you and, and, and the ways in which uh, you, that, that privilege is dismantled. So I say that to say um, navigating the spaces. I think it's important for me to acknowledge even small instances of like the power of my accent. I am treated a particular way until I speak. And that might speak to a long history of, of, of a romanticization of the British accent. But you will see readily in these spaces where race is a huge factor and I open my mouth and speak, there are instances where I acknowledge that I have been treated. I've now been treated in a different way than my African-American fellows. And you've got to kind of acknowledge all the different nuances, which for me is why I study the kind of different relationships between black people, period. Because I think that you can only begin to acknowledge your privilege as a black male versus a black female, as um, a black person of Nigerian descent that has a British accent, as opposed to a black person of Nigerian descent with a Nigerian accent. And just the ways in which you are, people respond to you. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but yeah, those are the kind of, it, like that, that example I gave might be a space in which I am a kind of going for a job interview and I see a flicker of the eye once I open my mouth to speak, which doesn't marry with like my name on, on the top of the resume paper. In terms of my writing, it might mean, um, that I'm uniquely placed to kind of speak about things through this three-dimensional uh, viewpoint uh, in terms of kind of navigating Black Mountain, which is a, where Warren Wilson holds their residencies. Uh, I feel a kind of double weight of being, uh, I always do that when I leave, the, or I always feel that when I leave DC, it's kind of double weight of being a foreigner in two ways. Like I'm, I'm, I'm heading to a part of America that I'm not familiar with and I'm not an American navigating these spaces. Uh, I don't know how yet that is to show up in my writing. That's, that's an, that would be an interesting thought for me because I primarily, the, the stories that I do write primarily are, um, take place in DC, which is again writing about I know, what I know and my relationship with Black Americans in DC and how another great example, gentrification. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's deep. Washington DC has one of the highest rates of gentrification in the US. It's a rapidly changing city. It's changed within the 10 years that I have been here. And, and what is my place in that? Right. You know, I, um, in many ways, uh, I might constitute part of that gentrification. And that goes back to class. And that's not necessarily because I'm a foreigner, but you know, I like my Starbucks, admittedly. Um, I like when my Starbucks are local. And those are conversations you kind of have to acknowledge that, you know, are you part of, are you sometimes part of the problem, even as a black person. It's not always just down to race. Well, I mentioned earlier that you're working on a composite novel. Do you mind just explaining what a composite novel is, why you decided on that form, and, and what you hope the project um, will accomplish? Well, here we go, because um, I'm not even sure. Like these, these kind of names that we give to different types of literary works can be so fluid, as I understand it. Right. So that people, I get, I gave this name so that people can better understand my, my project. As I understand it, a linked collection or, um, uh, a, a set of sort of, uh, linked stories is where you have a kind of a collection that may feature the same characters, but each story kind of stands up within there for themselves on their own. For me, I think of a, I think I think of a composite novel as doing almost the same thing. So each story could theoretically stand on its own. But when read chronologically, you get an even greater story. Uh, and that's kind of why I call it a composite novel, because you have these different worlds and um, DC, London and Lagos coming together. Um, through these various different stories. 
But actually, um, I'm hoping, if I get this right, that by the time you come to the end of the story, you see a greater story there, one story. Well, it sounds sounds great. Uh, I'm, I can't wait to read it. And you're working on the project at the same time that you're in the M- MFA program at Warren Wilson, which is a low residency <laughs> program um, that takes four semesters to complete and is carried out by alternating on-campus residency sessions with semesters of independent study under close faculty supervision. Um, The residencies are attended by all faculty and students. They're 10 days long and take place two times a year, once in early January and once in early July. What was it about the low-res option that appealed to you, and and why Warren Wilson? In short, the low-residency program appealed to me I think it appeals to most people is that they, um, they have something, essentially have something going on in their worlds or lives, um, that don't allow them to attend a kind of full year MFA college program. I kind of felt like I wanted to, you know, I, I, I don't know what I don't know. And I knew that, that, that I wanted, to, there's always room for growth when it came to like my craft. But I also knew that I was at a stage in my life where um, I'm, I'm sort of working full time and I couldn't really afford in many ways, um, not just financially, uh, to attend a, a full MFA program. And so the idea of low res appealed to me just bubbling on the surface of my mind for some time. And then I went along to the... Uh, the Bread Loaf uh, Writers Conference. Um, I spent three years, um, three consecutive years attending the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. And in that time, you know, I was part of the Wader Work Study Scholarship Program and spoke to sort of fellow people in that program. And they would, um, you know, a number of them had attended the Warren Wilson Program. And then you have faculty members at Bread Loaf, like Christopher Castellani, Laura Vandenberg, who kind of, also talked about how great um, the Warren Wilson program is uh, as a low residency program. And then, of course, you do your research. You, I went along and sort of jumped on the internet and found out about low res programs. And Warren Wilson was amongst the best, if not the best. And then during my third year at Red Loaf, um, I went to a kind of meet and greet where you met kind of the faculty of the Warren the Warren Wilson program, and they said a little bit more. And you know, our, um, the founder of the program, Ellen Bryant Voigt, has, has a longstanding relationship with, with the Breadloaf Writers Conference. And I was pretty much sold that if I'm going to do a low res, um, it was going to be this one. And then Samantha Hunt, who also met at Breadloaf, the office Samantha Hunt, put me on to Avan Jordan and she had a conversation with Avan Jordan, um, and he was kind of like, yo, you've got to, you've got to do this. And this might bring you to your next question. He was like, you know, and, and you really need to like apply for uh, the Holden scholarship. Yeah. We're definitely going to talk about the Holden scholarship and some of the funding stuff. But before we get to that, you know, the, the low residency program is so clearly divided between like this time on campus and this time away from campus. I'm hoping to give listeners kind of a sense of what both of those things really look and feel like. So let's start with the residencies. Can you just like walk us through what those 10 days look like? Definitely. So pre-pandemic, you would arrive on site to um, the Warren Wilson campus, which is outside of Black Mountain in Asheville, North Carolina. And it would be 10 days full of readings, workshop, bookshop, and um, craft talks and lectures. And so just to say kind of, just to walk back a little bit and say, um, something on each of those, um, workshops, typical workshop format, you, you know, you prior to it arriving, you would have read each other's work and you would comment. And also what's wonderful about that is that they're not of your, you know, everybody in your workshops, not from the same cohort. There are people that have, uh, have just joined for the first semester. There may be other other students who are in the third semester. And so you kind of have this various people at this different stage and um, workshops are led by two faculty members of staff. And Deborah Albury, 
the, the program director has this wonderful way in which, you know, it's like mental science. You will never have the same workshop uh, leader throughout the duration of your time. Um, so you're really kind of hearing throughout the, the course from different people, you know, how they feel about your work. Um, so you have the workshop, you have bookshop, which is, um, like an in-depth study of a particular book, uh, which you'll be, you'll be given a selection beforehand and, and, um, you'll have to read, write an essay or rather an annotation looking at a particular craft element within that book and then coming along during residency and having these sort of, um, six hour conversations broke up into two classes of three hours. And you'll kind of discuss the books and the things that you loved about the books and the things that weren't particularly working, et cetera. So that would be the bookshops. And then you have these wonderful kind of lectures and conferences that are given by faculty. Um, and then of course, pre pandemic, you had that wonderful kind of community and off schedule time where you just kind of like, Maybe you find Charles Baxter <laughs> sitting at a table during lunch and you sit down and, and you're able to have a conversation with him. Or, you know, you uh, spend some time with your cohort and arrange a, a cohort reading. I, I wanted to ask you about the cohort and, and just like, I, I think one of the worries for people who are considering low res programs is that they might miss out on like a sense of community since they don't spend as much time together. So have you found that like in those residency times, you've been able to like get to know the other people in the program and build some relationships and community? Well, you know, I have to preface this by saying I've I've never done like on-site MFA. So I have no sort of comparison in that way. But when I can kind of compare it to sort of courses that I have been on, I'd very much say that you still have we're still able to foster a sense of community even if that's in the virtual space so cohorts um come together initially during the residency um at a meet and greet with new faculty there's also a new student reading that's arranged and you find ways and i think this is just something that has been sort of fostered traditionally you find ways to have one or two cohort meetings during um residency and really, from there, people kind of go off and utilize applications like GroupMe uh, to stay in constant contact and arrange kind of times where you do kind of jump on calls or Zoom gatherings. And I, uh, and they're also kind of what I describe as affinity groups. David Haynes leads one that's, that's, that's focused on diversity and, um, you're able to kind of like come together uh, during times in the year outside of residency where you can kind of discuss pertinent issues. And then outside of those two residencies each year, students can work um, from anywhere in the country or, or the world, I assume. Um, I imagine for any current MFA students studying during the pandemic, this is going to sound pretty familiar, but walk us through what participation in the program looks like outside of those residency times. Yeah, great. So you have, um, so you go with, you go away from the residency having been assigned a supervisor. And, um, that's one of the great things about, um, Warren Wilson is that they have like a very low student to supervisor ratio. They say it's, it's, um, on the website, they'll say it's no more than five, but in my experience, like it's, it's never been more than three so far. That, faculty advisor supervisor will work with you through the period duration of those four to five months between the residency that you just left and the next residency and you'll have six what's called a packet you'll have six packets and in each of those packets depending on what stage you're at you're to deliver like a certain amount of pages as a fiction writer or a poet per packet deadline along with um a couple of annotations where you're looking at that particular piece of work and seeing what you can kind of glean from that work that would inform your own personal writing um, growth. Uh, and then you'll have this letter, which is an important part of, of, of the process in which, you know, you'll just talk to your faculty supervisor and they will um, respond to your concerns 
in their own way, in their response to your packet, which is delivered three days later with a uh, sort of feedback on your, both your essays and your writing and kind of suggestions in that letter about the things that you're doing well and suggestions. Maybe sometimes they'll send a couple of essays your way, some videos. It's really, um, it's really quite fluid in the way that they each experience that I've had with a different supervisor has been uh, kind of unique in its own way. So, for example, I spent a lot of time during my second semester working with Leslie and Neko Arima, um, who uh, is brilliant when it comes to speculative fiction and world building, and we kind of really zoomed in on that and, and how it was working in, in uh, not working within my own work. And you mentioned that those supervisors are assigned. Do you have some like say in who you might be assigned to? Like, can you put in a request for someone who you think like you, you know, like writes work that you can really learn from? You want to work with this particular faculty member, you can request that? Definitely. Yeah. Um, and it varies, right? So you will, um, you'll get to the residency and you'll have, you'll write up a proposal of how, what you want to do for, that the coming semester, um, where you think your work is and some of the things that you struggle with, um, and what you kind of want to look at, um, as you, as you spend the next four, five months in this deep work. And then, you know, you'll, you, you know, you'll already be provided with a list of faculty members and you'll, you can make, um, suggestions sort of your three choices as to who you want to work with. Um, But they make it, they also make it clear that they kind of, they've been doing this for a while (laughs) and they know who is best for your work based on the proposal that um, you put together. So for example, um, during my third semester, which um, I should say for the listeners uh, at Warren Wilson, you focus on a essay. So that's akin, that's akin to like a thesis. And that's not, there's very little creative work during your third semester. Whereas previously you wrote these sort of three to four page essays. You're now going to write like a thesis. You're now going to write like a 40 to 50 page essay on one or two pieces of work. And you're really, really going to zoom in. Um, you know, when it came to that semester, I really didn't know who was best for me to, to pair with and. You know, I think I literally wrote on the form, I trust y'all to make this, to make this happen. And I was, I was paired with Peter Orner, who was just awesome. Um, and yeah, I saw on the website, it says something about, uh, how all students are required to successfully complete four semester long projects. I assume that's what you're talking about when you say like this critical thesis in the first semester or these, um, packets that you were working on in other semesters. That is correct. And, and I should be clear about that. So the first semester, you'll have like these packets and the second semester, it'll be the same thing, uh, these packets, but an emphasis on writing what they call double annotations, which is double length essays where you are kind of looking at either two pieces of work that are doing the same thing, say with like repetition or you were, um, looking at one piece of work and sort of two aspects of craft in that one piece of work and a relationship between the two. And that is to prepare you for the third semester in which you're writing this essay, as I mentioned. And then the fourth semester, you're, you, you'll primarily be focusing on a creative thesis manuscript. So because students in the program are not on campus year round, there are fewer opportunities for things like teaching assistantships. Um, However, I looked around the website. It does appear there are some like need-based grants, several scholarships and fellowships. You mentioned earlier that you um, received the Holden Scholarship. Could you tell us about that award and uh, what it provides? Yeah, so the the Holden Scholarship was an award that was um, named by an an anonymous, actually, benefactor slash donor. Sorry, provided by anonymous donor but named after um, someone who 
uh, brought the MFA program to Warren Wilson. And it basically provides uh, tuition free for the entire four semesters opportunities to writers of color. And I was fortunate to receive that. And uh, with this scholarship, I feel like I'm part of a, a, a longstanding kind of legacy that kind of features great writers like the poet A. Van Jordan um, and Reginald D. Betts, Cynthia Oka, who uh, were all kind of holding scholarships in the past. Um, and it really kind of, yeah, gave me the opportunity to um, attend Warren Wilson. Um, and there are also sort of Holden residency scholarships that are provided for, again, people of color who want to attend a residency just to see what, 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 what it's like before fully committing to the program. And I'll add that there are also a variety of other kind of beyond the Holden scholarship. There are also a variety of other kind of scholarships and opportunities for people. So do you have a sense of like, how many students get a scholarship each year or get like a fellowship each year who attend Warren Wilson? I do not. And I, 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 and, and this speaks to kind of um, the community that Warren Wilson fosters, right? So I am coming to my final semester. I'm in the midst of my final semester right now. And I don't know if many people actually know that I'm a holding scholarship. Um, I don't think many people actually know kind of my publications history, et cetera. And that's intentional. Like there's this air of non-competition that I think the program, people like Deb Aubrey work hard to foster that it's not about what you've been awarded with um, or what, how many stories you've published. Um, it's really about doing the work. And so to that end, I don't actually know who received what. Um, I do know a little bit more detail about the Holden Scholarship and how there are a sort of, I think there are three of us currently. I couldn't really speak on the numbers for the other opportunities. Um, well, one of the things that the school argues, of course, is that like the low residency option allows you to keep your job if you have one, a career. You don't have to leave that to like move somewhere to attend the program. Have you continued to work while you're in the program or are you just focusing on the program right now? I was going to say, um, I was going to say something else that it allows you, um, to uh, fully come to terms with is the writer's life. And that could mean for many people working a job as you try to get stuff done. And, and, and that's my case. Um, so I am working full time and that is really kind of, um, pushed me to be, I don't think I'm quite there yet, um, disciplined. <laughs> um, I'm certainly more disciplined than what I was in the past, but I feel like there's a ways to go. And it's like, it really um, prepares you for that. And my first semester supervisor, Christopher Castellani, mentioned that from the off, that like, it's really going to train you how to live your life and find the time to write and that you're going to be amazed at, despite the limitations, the perceived limitations, you find the time to get it done. And I think that that's what Warren Wilson kind of gives you that experience that like, for some, they do take that time off. For others, they kind of learn to factor writing into their lives in a really disciplined way. And then the other point is, um, on the other side of that, you know, I've heard from graduates who will say they've graduated and they find that they have all this time and they continue those kind of writing practices that they picked up during the program. Well, that's great. And, um, I'm not sure what you do for work, but, uh, I know, you know, because it's, because it's low residency and there aren't these uh, teaching assistantships that you would find at a lot of other MFA programs. I know some people who c c are considering the low res option are concerned about whether there are opportunities to gain teaching experience. Um, have you found that there are ways to gain teaching experience while in this program? That's a really interesting question as it kind of pertains to my own experience uh, because I was previously teaching for some time at an art school in DC and then um, 
adjuncting at American University for a short while uh, before joining my uh, my uh, my previous place, my current place of employment, uh, which is uh, at a ed tech curriculum development company called Common Lit. But so I have I kind of had that teaching experience under my belt. But I imagine for a lot of people coming in that that's not the case and that that is going to present some challenges. Um, you do wet your mouth in that final residency where you do get to teach a class that you've, you've, um, curated and, and prepared for. And then it feels to me that there are opportunities through the alumni network. There's a strong alumni network, friends of writers that um, provides grants and scholarships as well as other postgrad opportunities that could possibly lead towards um, teaching assistantships, etc. Um, but there are there aren't any direct. That's something to consider that there aren't any direct opportunities to gain like a concerted teaching experience while in the program. Well, I I feel like you've provided a lot of really great information for anyone who's considering Warren Wilson or a low res program. But before we go, I just want to give you the last word here. Any advice that you have for someone who's considering this option, um, whether it be a low res program somewhere else or at Warren Wilson? I'd say, take a look at your life, right? I'd say two things, take a look at your life. Um, and you have to evaluate two things, whether you have the sp- Space, and this is going to sound contradictory, whether you have the kind of time on your hands to take on a low res program, and then whether you have the time on your hands to take on a low res program. And I mean that to say, on the one hand, you have a job, etc., or you maybe have some other commitments. And so that kind of lends well to taking on the low res program. But on the other hand, are those commitments going to get in the way of you successfully matriculating through this program because a low res program is not a cakewalk. It's not any easier than attending a full program. In some ways it might actually be harder. And yeah. And then on the second hand, um, at least when it comes to Warren Wilson, they make it very clear that this is, this is a program to train you how to be a better writer. It is not. Um, you are accredited with an MFA, a full MFA at the end of it. But that's not the prime. That's not the primary goal here. And the primary goal is not to get you published either. It's to make you a better writer. Well, Koye, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming by and chatting with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>